Section 28 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Olson, Fytak, Los Angeles. The Glories of Ireland. Edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Section 28. Native Irish Poetry by Professor Georges Dautin. Note. This chapter was written in French by M. Dautin, who is a distinguished professor and dean at the University of Renac, France. The translation into English has been made by the editors. By the year 1200 of the Christian era, a time at which the other national literatures of Europe were scarcely beginning to develop, Ireland possessed, and had possessed for several centuries, a Gaelic poetry, which was either the creation of the soul of the people, or else was the work of the courtly bards. This poetry was at first expressed in rhythmical verses, each containing a fixed number of accented syllables and hemisticks separated by a pause. Christlim, Christreum, Christ Indagat, Christ Indium, Christ Isum, Christ Uasum, Christ Desum, Christ Uasum. This versification, one of the elements of which was the repetition of words or sounds at regular intervals, was transformed about the eighth century into a more learned system. Thenceforward, alliteration, assonance, rhyme, and a fixed number of syllables constituted the characteristics of Irish verse. Misa ochus pangurabhan, hichtar nachar friasandan, bita men ma samfixerlich, mumen ma keen im sechthert. As we see, the consonants in the rhyme words were merely related. L, R, N, N, G, M, D, H, G, H, b h m h c h t h f could rhyme together just as could g g d d b b soon the poets did not limit themselves to end rhymes which ran the risk of becoming monotonous but introduced also internal rhyme which set up what we may call a continuous chain of melody is er karam dore ara reda agone sa homat a engel hind o shind go athrela this harmonious versification was replaced in the seventeenth century by a system in which account was no longer taken of consonantal rhyme or of the number of syllables the rules of irish verse have nothing in common with classical latin metres which were based on the combination of short and long syllables. In low Latin, indeed, we find occasionally alliteration, rhyme, and a fixed number of syllables, but these novelties are obviously of foreign origin, and date from the time when the Romans borrowed them from the nations which they called barbarous. We cannot prove, beyond yea or nay, that they are of celtic origin but it is extremely probable that they are for it is among the celts both of ireland and of wales that the harmonizing of vowels and of consonants has been carried to the highest degree of perfection this learned art was not acquired without long study the training of a poet filet lasted twelve years or more the poets had a regular hierarchy. The highest in rank, the Olav, knew 350 kinds of verse and could recite 250 principal and 100 secondary stories. The Olavs lived at the court of the kings and the nobles, who granted them freehold lands. Their persons and their property were sacred, and they had established in Ireland schools in which the people might learn history poetry and law the bards formed a numerous class of a rank inferior to the filet they did not enjoy the same honours and privileges 
some of them even were slaves according to their standing different kinds of verse were assigned to them as a monopoly the danish invasions in the ninth century set back for some time the development of irish poetry but when the irish had driven the fierce and aggressive sea rovers from their country there was a literary renaissance this was in turn checked by the anglo-norman invasion in the twelfth century and thereafter the art of versification was no longer so refined as it had formerly been nevertheless the bardic schools still existed in the seventeenth century more than four hundred years after the landing of strongbow and in them students followed the lectures of the olams for six months each year or until the coming of spring exercising both their talents for composition and their memory a catalogue of irish poets which has recently been made out shows that there were more than a thousand of them we have lost many of the oldest poems but the irish scribes often modernized the texts which they were copying hence the language is not always a sufficient indication of date and it is possible that under a comparatively modern form some very ancient pieces may have been preserved even if the poems attributed to amergin do not go back to the tenth century b c as has been claimed for them they are in any case old enough to be archaic and certain poems of the mythological cycle are undoubtedly anterior to the christian era we have reason to believe that there have been preserved some genuine poems of finn macumal third century a hymn by saint patrick d four sixty one some greatly altered verses of saint columcille d five ninety seven and certain hymns written by saints who lived from the seventh to the ninth century the main object of the most celebrated of the ancient poets up to the end of the twelfth century was to render history genealogy toponymy and lives of saints readier of access and easier to retain by putting them into verse form and it is the names of those scholars that have been rescued from oblivion while lyric poetry having as its basis nothing more than sentiment has remained for the most part anonymous after the anglo-norman invasion the best poet seems to have been don cadach morodali d twelve forty four of later date were teg magdere fifteen seventy to sixteen fifty two teg dal o'higgin d sixteen fifteen and jokadech o'hasi who belonged to the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries the new school which abandoned the old rules and whose inspiration is now personal now patriotic is represented by kene keens or laments abran hymns or eislingi visions composed among others by geoffrey keating d c sixteen fifty david obrodar c sixteen twenty five to sixteen ninety eight egan o'reilly c sixteen seventy c seventeen thirty four john macdonnell sixteen ninety one to seventeen fifty four william o'heffernan f l seventeen fifty john o'tawmy seventeen o six to seventeen seventy five and andrew mcgrath d c seventeen ninety the greatest of the eighteenth century irish poets was owen roe o'sullivan c seventeen forty eight to seventeen eighty four whose songs were sung everywhere and who in the opinion of his editor father dinin is the literary glory of his country and deserves to be ranked among the few supreme lyric poets of all time if in order to study the subjects treated by the poets we lay aside didactic poetry and confine ourselves to the ancient poems from the seventh to the eleventh century 
we shall find in the latter a singular variety they were at first dialogues or monologues now found incorporated with the sagas of which they may have formed the original nucleus thus in the voyage of bran we have the account of the isles of the blessed and the discourse of the king of the sea in the expedition of loger macrinachan the brilliant description of the fairy hosts in the death of the sons of unsech the touching farewell of deirdre to the land of scotland and her lamentation over the dead bodies of the three warriors and in the lay of fothard canan the strange and thrilling speech of the dead lover returning after the battle to the tryst appointed by his sweetheart other poems seem never to have figured in a saga like the song of crede daughter of Goere, in which she extols the memory of her friend Dinartach and the affecting love scenes between Liaden and Kurtir, or like the bardic songs designed to distribute praise or blame. The funeral panegyric on King Nial in alternate verses, the song of the sword of Carol, and the satire of Macongline against the monks of Cork religious poetry comprised lyric fragments which were introduced into the lives of the saints and there formed a kind of christian saga or else were based on holy writ like the lamentation of eve hymns in honour of the saints like the hymn to saint michael by male isu pieces such as the famous hymn of saint patrick and philosophic poems like that keen analysis of the flight of thought which dates from the tenth century at a time when the poets of other lands seem wholly engrossed in the recital of the deeds of men one of the great and constant distinguishing marks of poetry in ireland whether we have to do with a short note set down by a scribe on the margin of a manuscript or with a religious or profane poem is a deep personal and intimate love of nature expressed not by detailed description but more often by a single picturesque and telling epithet thus we have the hermit who prays god to give him a hut in a lonely place beside a clear spring in the wood with a little lark to sing overhead or we have marban who rich in nuts crab apples sloes watercress and honey refuses to go back to the court to which the king his brother presses him to return now we have the description of the summer scene in which the blackbird sings and the sun smiles now the song of the sea and of the wind which blows tempestuously from the four quarters of the sky again the winter song when the snow covers the hills when every furrow is a streamlet and the wolves range restlessly abroad while the birds numbed to the heart are silent or yet again the recluse in his cell humorously comparing his quest of ideas to the pursuit of the mice by his pet cat this deep love of inanimate and animate things becomes individualized in those poems in which every tree every spring every bird is described with its own special features if we remember that these original poems which before the twelfth century expressed thoughts that were scarcely known to the literature of europe before the eighteenth are besides clothed in the rich garb of a subtle harmony what admiration what respect and what love ought we not to show to that ancient ireland which in the darkest ages of western civilization not only became the depositary of latin knowledge and spread it over the continent but also had been able to create for herself new artistic and poetic forms references hyde love songs of connacht dublin eighteen ninety three irish poetry an essay in irish with translation in english and a vocabulary dublin 1902 the religious songs of connacht london 1906 meyer ancient gaelic poetry 
glasgow 1906 a primer of irish metrics with a glossary and an appendix containing an alphabetical list of the poets of ireland dublin 1909 dotin dunn the gaelic literature of ireland washington 1906 meyer selections from ancient irish poetry second edition london 1913 best bibliography of irish philology and of printed irish literature dublin 1913 Loth, la métrique galloise paris 1902 thurnason mythalische wesleren irische text 3 Bouille la Dublin, 1910. End of section 28. Recording by Linda Olson Fitak, Los Angeles. Section number 29 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Irish Heroic Sagas by Eleanor Hull. Ireland has the unique distinction of having preserved for mankind a full and vivid literary record of a period otherwise, so far as native memorials are concerned, clouded in obscurity. A few fragmentary suggestions, derived from ancient stone monuments or from diggings in tumuli and graves, are all that gaul or britain have to contribute to a knowledge of that important period just before and just after the beginning of our era when the armies of rome were overrunning western europe and were brought for the first time into direct contact with the celtic peoples of the west almost all that we know of the early inhabitants of these countries comes to us from the pens of roman writers and soldiers posidonius caesar diodorus tactus we may give these observers credit for a desire to be fair to peoples they sometimes admired and often dreaded but conquerors are not always the best judges of the races they are engaged in subduing especially when they are ignorant of their language unversed in their lore and customs and unused to their ways valuable as are the reports of roman authorities we feel at every point the need of checking them by native records but the native records of gaul and in large part also those of britain and wales have been swept away caesar is probably right in saying that the druids who were the learned men of their race and day committed nothing to writing if they did whatever they wrote has been irrevocably lost but ireland was exempt from the sweeping changes brought about through long periods of roman and saxon occupation no great upheaval from without disturbed the native political and social conditions up to the coming of the norse and danes about the beginning of the ninth century agricola standing on the western coast of britain looked across the dividing channel and reflected upon the beneficial connection that the conquest of ireland would have formed between the most powerful parts of the roman empire but fortunately for the literature of ireland if not for her history he never came the early incursions of the scotty or irish were eastward into england wales and gaul and there seem to have been few return movements towards the west ireland pursued her path of native development undisturbed it is to this circumstance that she owes the preservation of so much of her native literature a great body of material historical religious poetic romantic showing marks of having originated at a very early time and a great variety and interest at what period this literature first began to be written down we do not know Erosius tells us that a traveller named Athicus spent a considerable time in Ireland early in the fifth century, examining their volumes, which tends to prove that there was writing in Ireland before St. Patrick. But the native bard must have made writing superfluous. The man who could, at a moment's notice, recite any one out of the 350 stories which might be called for, besides poetry, genealogies, and travel records, was worth many books only a few were expert enough to read his writings but all could enjoy his tales the earliest written records that we have now existing date from the seventh or eighth century but undoubtedly there is preserved for us in these materials a picture of social conditions going back to the very beginning of our era and covell 
with the strange stage of civilization known as archaeology as latena or late celtic to help his memory the early shanishi or storyteller grouped his romantic story store under different heads such as tains or cattle spoils feasts elopements sieges battles destructions tragical deaths but it is easy for us now to group them in another way and to class together the series of tales referring to the duitha de Dedanin, or ancient deities those belonging to the red branch cycle of king kokobar and kuchilain those relating to finn and the legends of the kings the hundred or more tales belonging to the second group are especially valuable for social history on account of the detailed descriptions they give of customs dress weapons habits of life and ethical ideas to the historian folklorist and student of primitive civilizations they are documents of the highest importance it seems likely that the red branch cycle of tales including the epic tale of the tain or cattle spoil of Kulenge, which has gathered round itself a number of minor tales had some basis of historical fact and arose in the period of ulster's predominance to celebrate the deeds of a band of warlike champions who flourished in the north about the beginning of the christian era no one who has visited the raths of the aman macha near Ma, where stood the traditional site of the ancient capital of ulster or has followed the well-defined and massive outworks of rath Kelcher, and the forts of the other heroes whose deeds the tales embody could doubt that they had their origin in great events that once happened there the topography of the tales is absolutely correct or again when we cross over into Kanat, the remains of rath cronin near the ancient palace of the amazonian queen med testify to similar events she it was who in her pillow talk with her husband alia declared that she had married him only because in him did she find the strange bride gift which her imperious nature demanded a man without stinginess without jealousy without fear it was in her desire to surpass her husband in wealth that she sent the combined armies of the south and west into ulster to carry off a famous bull the brown bull of cooley the only match in ireland for one possessed by her spouse this raid forms the central subject of the tain Boculanche. the motive of the tale and the kind of life described in it alike show the primitive conditions out of which it had rise it belongs to a time when land was plenty for the scattered inhabitants to dwell upon but stock to place upon it was scarce the possession of herds was necessary not only for food and the provisioning of troops but as a standard of wealth proof of position and a means of exchange everything was estimated before the use of money by its value in keen or herds when med and ale compare their possessions to find out which of them is better than the other their herds of cattle swine and horses are driven in their ornaments and jewels their garments and vats and household appliances are displayed the pursuit of the cattle of neighboring tribes was the prime cause of the innumerable raids which made every man's life one of perpetual warfare much more so than the acquisition of land or the avenging of wrongs hence a motive that may seem to us insufficient and remote as the subject of a great epic arose out of the necessities of actual life cattle driving is the oldest of all occupations in ireland the conditions we find described in these tales show us an open country generally unenclosed by hedges or walls the chariots can drive straight across the province there are no towns and the stopping places are the large farmers dwellings open inns known as houses of hospitality fortified by surrounding raths or earthen walls the only private property and land in a time when the tribe land was common that we hear of at this period within these borders lay the pleasure grounds and gardens of the cattle sheds for the herds which the great landowners or chief loaned out to the smaller men in return for services rendered here were trained in the arts of industry and fine needlework the daughters of the chief men of the tribe and their foster sisters drawn from the humbler families around them the rivers as a rule formed the boundaries of the provinces and the fords were constantly guarded by champions who challenged every wayfarer to single combat if he could not show sufficient reason for crossing the borderland these combats were fought actually in the fort itself and all wars began in a long series of single hand-to-hand -hand combats between equal champions before the armies as a whole engaged each other to fight was every man's prime duty 
and the man who had slain the largest number of his fellows was acclaimed as the greatest hero it was the proud boast of the conal Kernanch, the victorious that seldom had a day passed in which he had not challenged a Connaughtman, and a few nights in which a Connaughtman's head had not formed his pillow it shows the primitive savagery of the period that skulls of enemies were worn dangling from the belt and were stored up in one of the palaces of iman maka as trophies of valor so warlike were the heroes that even during friendly feasts their weapons had to be hung up in a separate house lest they should spring to arms in rivalry with their own fellows yet in spite of this rude barbarism of outward life the warriors had formed for themselves a high and exacting code of honor which may be regarded as the first steps toward what in later times and other countries became known as chivalry save that there is in the acts of irish heroes a simplicity and sincerity which puts them on a higher level than the obligatory courtesies of more artificial ages generosity between enemies was carried to an extraordinary pitch twice over in fights with different foes connell kiernak binds his right hand to his side in order that his enemy who had lost one hand may fight on equal terms with him the two severest combats sustained by Kukulin, the youthful ulster champion in the long war of the Tain are those with Locke the great and ferdinand both first-rate warriors who had been forced by the wiles of meb into unwilling conflict against their young antagonist in their youth they had been fellow pupils in the school of the amazon who had taught them both alike the arts of war when Locke the great as a dying request prays kulikang to permit him to rise so that he may fall on his face and not backwards toward the men of erin lest hereafter it should be said that he fell in flight kulika replies that will i will surely for it is a warrior's boon thou cravest and he steps back to allow the wounded man to reverse his position to the ford the tale of kulikan's combat with ferdiad had become classic nothing more pathetic or more full of the true spirit of chivalry is to be found in any literature each warrior estimates nobly the prowess of the other each sorrowfully recalls the memory of his old friendships and expeditions made together when frigadid falls his ancient comrade pours out over him a passionate lament each night when the day's combat is over they throw their arms round each other's neck and embrace their horses are put up in the same paddock and their charioteurs sleep beside the same fire each night Kulikane sends to his wounded friend a share of the herbs that are applied to his own wounds while to kulaklane ferdiad sends a fair half of the pleasant delicate food supplied to him by the man of erin we may recall too kulaklane's act of compassion toward queen meb near the close of the tain her army is flying in rout homeward across the shannon closely pursued by kulaklane as he approaches the ford he finds queen medeba lying prostrate on the bank unable any longer to guard the retreat of her army she appeals to her enemy to aid her and kulaklane with that lovable boyish delight in acts of supreme generosity which is always ascribed to him undertakes to shield the retreat of the disordered host from his own troops and to see them safely across the river while medb reposes peacefully in a field hard by the spirit which actuates the heroes is well expressed by kulaklane when his friends would restrain him from going forth to his last fight knowing that in that battle he must fall i had rather than the whole world's gold and then the earth's riches that death had ere now befallen me so would not this shame and testimony of reproach now stand recorded against me for in every tongue this noble old saying is remembered fame outlives life the irish tales surpass those of the arthurian cycle in simplicity in humour and in human interest the characters are not mere types of fixed virtues and vices they have each a strongly marked individuality consistently adhered to through the multitude of different stories in which they play a part this is especially the case with regard to the female characters emmer deirdre etan grain may be said to have introduced into european literature new types of womanhood quite unlike in their sprightliness and humour their passionate affection and heroic qualities to anything found elsewhere stories about women play a large part in ancient irish literature their elopements their marriages their griefs and tragedies form the subject of a large number of tales 
among the list of tales that any bard might be called upon to recite the courtships or wooings probably formed a favorite group they are of great variety and beauty the irish indeed may be called the inventors of the love tale for modern europe the gravest effect of this literature a defect which is common to all early literature before coming under the chastening hand of the master is undoubtedly its tendency to extravagance though much depended upon the individual writer some being stylus some not and all were prone to frequent and, and grotesque exaggerations the lack of restraint and self-criticism is everywhere apparent the old irish writer seems incapable of judging how to shape his material with the view to presenting it in its best form thus we have the feeling even with regard to the tain beau challenge that what has come down to us is rather the rough-shaped material of an epic than a completed design the single stories and the groups of stories that have been handled and rehandled at different times but only occasionally as in the story of deirdre the sorrowful tale of the sons of usnick or in the later versions of the wooing of emmer or the book of leinster version of the wooing of ferb do we feel that a competent artist has so formed his story the best possible value has been extracted from it yet in spite of their defects the old heroic sagas of ireland have in them a stimulating force and energy and an element of fine and healthy optimism which is strangely at variance with the popular conception of the melancholy of irish literature and which wherever they are known make them the fountainhead of a fresh creative inspiration this stimulating of the imagination is perhaps the best gift that a revived interest in the old native romance of ireland has to bestow references the originals of many of the tales of the kulachin cycle of romances will be found usually accompanied by english or german translations in the volumes of ursh Uresh, text review celtique sheetskrift fur celt phil iru irish text society volume two atlantis proceed of the r irish academy irish mss series and todd lecture series english translations of the tain de boulange lou and ubl versions miss winifred's faraday 1904 ll version with conflate readings but by joseph dunn 1914 of various stories e hole the kuklang saga in irish literature 1898 a h leahy heroic romances of ireland nineteen o five to six the courtship of ferb nineteen o two french translations in the arbois de jubainvis epopee celtic on ireland german translations in thur mason segan odin alien ireland nineteen o one free rendering by s o grady in the coming of the kulikan nineteen o four and in his history of ireland the heroic period eighteen seventy eight for full bibliography see r i best bibliography of irish philology and printed literature nineteen thirteen and joseph dunn's tain beau pages thirty two through thirty six nineteen fourteen end of section twenty nine recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america Section number 30 of the Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Kavanagh, Antwerp. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Section number 30. Irish Precursors of Dante by Sidney Gunn, M.A. One of the supreme creations of the human mind is the Divine Comedy of Dante, and undoubtedly one of its chief sources is the literature of ancient Ireland. Dante himself was a native of Florence, Italy, and lived from 1265 to 1321. Like many great men he incurred the hatred of his countrymen, and he spent as a result the last twenty years of his life in exile with a price on his head. He had been falsely accused of theft and treachery, and his indignation at the wrong thus done him and at the evil conduct of his contemporaries led him to write his poem in which he visits hell purgatory and paradise and learns how god punishes bad actions and how he rewards those who do his will 
To the writing of his poem Dante brought all the learning of his time, all its science, and an art that has never been surpassed, perhaps never equalled. Of course he did not know any Irish, but he knew Italian, and the then universal tongue of the learned, Latin, in both of which were tales of visits to the other world, and the greater part of these tales, as well as those most resembling Dante's work, in form and spirit, were Irish in origin. All peoples have traditions of persons visiting the realms of the dead. Homer tells of Odysseus going there, Virgil is the same of Aeneas, and the Oriental peoples, as well as the Germanic races, have similar tales. But no people have so many or such finished accounts of this sort as the ancient Irish. In pagan times in Ireland, one of the commonest adventures attributed to a hero was a visit to Tirna Mio, the land of the living, or Tirna Nog, the land of the young. And this supernatural world was reached in some cases by entering a fairy mound and going beneath the ground to it, and in others by sailing over the ocean. Of the literature of pagan Ireland, though much has come down to us, we have only a very small fraction of what once existed. And what we have has been transmitted and modified by persons of later times in different culture, who, both consciously and unconsciously, have changed it, so that it is very different from what it was in its original form. But the subject and the main outline still remain, and we have many accounts of both voyages and underground journeys to the other world. The oldest voyage is, perhaps, that of Maldown, which Tennyson has transmuted into English under the title The Voyage of Maldoon. This is a voyage undertaken for revenge, but vengeance, as Sir Walter Scott has pointed out in his preface to the two drovers, springs in a barbarous society from a passion for justice. And it is this instinct for justice that inspires the Irish hero to endure and to achieve what he does. Christianity has preserved this legend and added to it its own peculiar quality of mercy. And this illustrates one of the characteristics of Ireland's pagan literature. It is imperfectly Christian, and can readily be made to express the Christian point of view. Another voyage of pagan Irish literature is the voyage of Bran. In this tale, idealism is the inspiration that leads the hero into an unknown world. A woman appears who is invisible to all but Bran, and whose song of the beauteous supernatural land beyond the wave is heard by none but him, so that, after refusing to go with her for the first time she appears, at length he steps into her boat of glass and sails away to view the wonders and taste the joys of the other world. In these tales we have two main elements, one real and one ideal. The real element is the fact that the ancient Irish unquestionably made voyages and visited lands which the fervid Celtic imagination and the lapse of time transformed into the wonderful regions of legends. The stories are thus early geographies, and they show unmistakably a knowledge of Western Europe and of the Canary Islands, or some other tropical regions. Perhaps also some have gone so far as to claim they are reminiscent of voyages to America. The ideal element is no less important as indicating achievement, for it shows that the Irish poets of pagan times had not only realised, but had succeeded in making their national traditions embody the fact that love of justice and aspiration for knowledge are the foundations of all enduring human achievement and all perfect human joy. Christianity therefore found moral and spiritual ideas of a highly developed order in pagan Ireland, and it did not hesitate to adopt whatever in the literature of the country illustrated its own teachings. And not only were these stories of visits to the other world full of suggestions as to ways of enforcing Christian doctrine, but the Irish church and men of Irish birth were the most active in spreading the faith in the early centuries of its conquest of Western Europe. For these reasons it is not strange that all the early Christian versions of the spirit world were of Irish origin. We find the earliest in the ecclesiastical history of the Venerable Bede, who died in 735. It is the story of how an Irishman of great sanctity, Fersius by name, was taken in spirit by three angels to a place from which he looked down and saw the four fires that are to consume the world, those of falsehood, avarice, discord, fraud and impiety. In this there is the germ of some very fundamental things in Dante's poem. And we know that Dante knew Bede, and had probably read his history, for he places him in paradise and mentions him elsewhere in his works. In Bede's work there is also another version, and though in this second case the man who visits the spirit world is not an Irishman, but a Saxon named Drithelm, 
yet the story came to be through an Irish monk named Haimgills. So it, too, is connected with Ireland, and it also contains much that is developed further in the Divine Comedy. One of the most celebrated of the works belong to this class of so-called visionary writings is the Fis, or Vision, which goes under the name of the famous Irish saint Adamnan, who was poetically entitled the High Scholar of the Western World. This particular vision, the Fis Adam Nine, is remarkable, among other things, for its literary quality, which is far superior to anything of the time, and for the fact that it represents the highest level of the school to which it belonged, and that it is the most important contribution made to the growth of the legend within the Christian Church prior to the advent of Dante. Another Irish vision of great popularity all over Europe in the Middle Ages is the Voyage of St. Brendan. This is known as the Irish Odyssey, and it is similar to the pagan tales of Maldun and Bran, except that instead of its hero being a dauntless warrior seeking vengeance or a noble youth seeking happiness, he is a Christian saint in quest of peace, and instead of the perils of the way being overcome by physical force or the favour of some capricious pagan deity, they are averted by the power of faith and virtue. The Voyage of St. Brendan, like its pagan predecessors, has a real and an ideal basis, and in both respects it shows an advancement over its prototypes. It contains some very poetic touches, and is credited with being the source of some of the most effective features of Dante's poem. Its great popularity is shown by the fact that Caxton, the first English printer, published a translation of it in 1483, so that it was among the first books printed in English, and for that reason must have been one of the best-known works of the time. Dante undoubtedly knew it, for he was a great scholar in the learning of his day, and especially in ecclesiastical history and the biography of saints. Another vision of Irish origin that Dante and other writers have borrowed from is that of an Irish soldier named Tundale. He is said to have been a very wicked and proud man, who refused to a friend who owed him for three horses an extension of time in which to pay for them. For this he was struck down by an invisible hand, so that he remained apparently dead from Wednesday till Saturday, when he revived and told a story of a visit to a world of the dead that has many features later embodied in the Divine Comedy. Tundale's vision is said to have taken place in 1149. Dante probably wrote his poem between 1314 and 1321. The Irish also produced another legend of this sort that was enormously and universally popular and became the chief authority on the nature of heaven and hell in the story of St. Patrick's Purgatory. St. Patrick was said to have been granted a view of heaven and hell, and a certain island in Loch Derg and Donegal was reputed to be the spot in which he had begun his journey. And there it was said, those who desired to purge themselves of their sins could enter, as he had entered, and come back to the world again, provided their faith was strong enough. This legend was probably known in Ireland from a very early time, but it had spread all over Western Europe by the 12th century. Henry of Saltry, a Benedictine monk of the Abbey of that name in England, wrote an account in Latin of the descent of an Irish soldier named Owen into St. Patrick's Purgatory in 1153, and this story soon became the subject of poetic treatment all over Europe. We have several French versions, one by the celebrated French poetess Marie de France, who lived about 1200, and there are others in all the languages of Europe, besides evidence of its wide circulation in the original Latin. Its importance is shown by the fact that it is mentioned by Matthew Paris, the chief English historian of the 13th century, and also by Frossard, the well-known French analyst of the 14th century, while Calderon, the great Spanish dramatist, has written a play based on the legend. Dante undoubtedly knew of Marie de France's version, as well as the original of Henry de Saltre, and probably others besides. From what has been said, it will be seen that Dante's masterpiece is largely based on literature of Irish origin, but there are other superlative exhibitions of human genius of which the same is true. One of these is the story of Tristan and Isolde. Tristan is the paragon of all knightly accomplishments, the most versatile figure in the entire literature of chivalry, while Isolde is an Irish princess. By a trick of fate, these two drink a love potion inadvertently and become irresistibly enamoured of each other, although Isolde is betrothed to King Mark of Cornwall, and Tristan is his nephew and ambassador. The story that follows is infinitely varied, intensely dramatic, delicately beautiful, and tenderly pathetic. It has been treated by several poets of great genius, among them Gottfried of Strasbourg, the greatest German poet of his time, and Richard Wagner, but all the beauty and power in the works of these men existed in the original Celtic form of the tale, 
and the later writers have only discovered it and brought it to light. The same thing is true of the Arthurian legends and the story of the Holy Grail. Dante knew of King Arthur's fame and mentions him in the Inferno. To Dante he was a Christian hero and the historical Arthur may have been a Christian, but much in the story goes back to the pagan Celtic religion. We can find in Irish literature many references that indicate a belief in a self-sustaining, miraculous object similar to the Holy Grail. And the fact that this object was developed into a symbol of some of the deepest and most beautiful Christian truths show the high character of the civilization and literature of ancient Ireland. References Wright, St. Patrick's Purgatory, London, 1844 Crap, The Legend of St. Patrick's Purgatory, Baltimore, 1900 Becker, Medieval Visions of Heaven and Hell, Baltimore, 1899 Shackford, Legends and Satires, Boston, 1913. Mayer and Nutt, The Voyage of Bran, edited and translated by K. Meyer with an essay on the Irish version of The Happy Other World and the Celtic Doctrine of Rebirth by A. Nutt, two volumes, London, 1895. Boswell, an Irish precursor of Dante, London, 1908. End of section 30. Section 31 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Irish Influence on English Literature by E. C. Quiggin, M. A. Among the literary peoples of the west of Europe, the Irish, in late medieval and early modern times, were singularly little affected by the frequent innovations in taste and theme which influenced Romance and Teutonic nations alike. To such an extent is this true that one is often inclined to think that far-off Iceland was to a greater degree in the general European current than the much more accessible Erin. During the age of chivalry, conditions in Ireland were not calculated to promote the growth of epic and lyric poetry after the continental manner. Some considerable time elapsed before the Norman barons became fully hibernicized, previous to which their interest may be assumed to have turned to the compositions of the Trouvères. In the early Norman period the poets of Ireland might well have begun to imitate Romance models, but strange to say they did not, and for this various reasons might be assigned. The flowing verses of the Anglo-Norman were impossible for men who delighted in the trammels of the native prosody, and in the heyday of French influence the patrons of letters in Ireland probably insisted on hearing the foreign compositions in their original dress, as these nobles were doubtless sufficiently versed in Norman French to be able to appreciate them. But a still more potent factor was the conservatism of the hereditary Irish poet families. A close corporation, they appear to have resented every innovation, and were content to continue the tradition of their ancestors. The direct consequence of this tenacious clinging to the fashions of bygone days rendered it impossible, nay, almost inconceivable, that the literary men of Ireland should have exerted any profound or immediate influence upon England or Western Europe. Yet nowadays few serious scholars will be prepared to deny that the island contributed in considerable measure to the common literary stock of the Middle Ages we might expect to find that direct influence, as a general rule, can be most easily traced in the case of religious themes. Here, in the literature of vision, so popular in Ireland, a chord was struck which continued to vibrate powerfully until the time of the Reformation. In this branch, the riotous fancy of the Celtic monk caught the medieval imagination from an early period. Bede has preserved for us the story of Fursey, an Irish hermit who died in France, A.D. 650. The greatest Irish composition of this class, with which we were acquainted, the vision of Adamnan, does not appear to have been known outside the island, but a later work of a similar nature met with striking success. This was the vision of Tundale, to Nudgal, written in Latin by an Irishman named Marcus at Regensburg, about the middle of the twelfth century. It seems probable that this work was known to Dante, and in addition to the numerous continental versions there is a rendering of the story into Middle English verse. Closely allied to the visions are the Imrama, or voyages, Latin navigationes. The earliest romances of this class are secular, e.g. Imram Meldwin, 
which provided Tennyson with the framework of his well-known poem. However, the notorious love of adventure on the part of the Irish monks inevitably led to the composition of religious romances of a similar kind. The most famous story of this description, The Voyage of St. Brendan, found its way into every Christian country in Europe, and consequently figures in the South English Legendary, a collection of versified lives of saints made in the neighborhood of Gloucester towards the end of the thirteenth century. The episode of St. Brendan and the Whale, moreover, was probably the ultimate source of one of Milton's best-known similes in his description of Satan. Equally popular was the visit of Sir Owain to the Purgatory of St. Patrick, which is also included in the same Middle English Legendary. Ireland further contributed, in some measure, to the common stock of medieval stories which were used as illustrations by the preachers, and in works of an edifying character. When we turn to purely secular themes, we find ourselves on much less certain ground. Though the discussion as to the origins of the romance of Uther's son, Arthur, continues with unabated vigor, many scholars have come to think that the Celtic background of these stories contains much that is derived from Hibernian sources some writers in the past have argued in favour of an independent survival of common celtic features in wales and ireland but now the tendency is to regard all such coincidences as borrowings on the part of kimrick craftsmen at the beginning of the twelfth century a new impulse seems to have been imparted to native minstrelsy in wales under the patronage of griffith ap Cynan, prince of gwynedd who had spent many years in exile at the court of dublin some of the Welsh rhapsodists apparently served a kind of apprenticeship with their Irish brethren, and many things Irish were assimilated at this time, which, through this channel, were shortly to find their way into Anglo-French. Thus it may now be regarded as certain that the name of the fair sword Excalibur, by Geoffrey called Caliburnus, Welsh, Calitfilch, is taken from Caladbolg, the far-famed broadsword of Fergus MacRoig, it does not appear that the whole framework of the Irish sagas was taken over, but, as Windish points out, episodes were borrowed, as well as tricks of imagery. So, to mention but one, the central incident of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is doubtless taken from the similar adventure of Cuchulain in Bricria's Feast. The share assigned to Irish influence in the Matière de Bretagne is likely to grow considerably with the progress of research. The fairy lore of Great Britain undoubtedly owes much to Celtic fantasy. Of this Chaucer, at any rate, has little doubt, as he writes, In the old days of the King Arthur, of which that Britain speak in great honour, all was this land fulfilled of fairy, the elf-queen with her jolly company danced full oft in many a green maid. And here again there is a reasonable probability that certain features were borrowed from the wealth of story current in the neighbouring isle. Otherwise it is difficult to understand why the Queen of Fairy should bear an Irish name, Mab, from Irish Maeve. And curiously enough, the form of the name Rathaf suggests that it was borrowed through a written medium and not by oral tradition. On the other hand, it is incorrect to derive Puck from Irish Puka, as the latter is undoubtedly borrowed from some form of Teutonic speech. So all-embracing a mind as that of the greatest English dramatist could not fail to be interested in the gossip that must have been current in London at the time of the wars in Ulster. References to kerns and gallow-glasses are fairly frequent. He had evidently heard of the marvellous powers with which the Irish bards were credited, for, in As You Like It, Rosalind exclaims, I was never so berhymed since Pythagoras's time, that I was an Irish rat, which I can hardly remember. Similarly, in King Richard the Third, mention is made of the prophetic utterance of an Irish bard, a trait which does not appear in the poet's source. Any statements as to Irish influence in Shakespeare that go beyond this belong to the realm of conjecture. Professor Kittredge has attempted to show that in Sir Orfeo, upon which the poet drew for portions of the plot of A Midsummer Night's Dream, the Irish story of Etain and Meter was fused with the medieval form of the classical tale of Orpheus and Eurydice. Direct influence is entirely wanting, and it is difficult to see how it could have been done otherwise. Even in the case of the Elizabethan poet, who spent many years in the south of Ireland, there is no trace of Hibernian lore or legend. Spencer, indeed, tells us himself that he had caused some of the native poetry to be translated to him, and had found that it savoured of sweet wit and good invention. But Ireland plays an infinitesimal part in the Fairy Queen— 
the scenery round Kilcolman Castle forms the background of much of the incident in Book V. Marble far from Ireland brought is mentioned in a simile in the second book, where we also read, As when a swarm of gnats at eventide out of the fens of Allen do arise. But Ireland supplied no further inspiration. The various plantations of the seventeenth century produced an Anglo-Irish stock which soon asserted itself in literature. As a typical example, we may take the author of The Vicar of Wakefield. At his first school at Lissoy, Oliver Goldsmith came under Thomas Byrne, a regular shanaki, possessed of all the traditional lore, with a remarkable gift for versifying. It was under this man that the boy made his first attempts at verse, and his memory is celebrated in the deserted village. There, in his noisy mansion, skilled to rule, the village master taught his little school. A man severe he was, and stern to view. Unfortunately, Goldsmith was removed to Elfin at the age of nine, and although he retained an affection for Irish music all his life, his intimate connection with Irish Ireland apparently ceased at this point. Sweet Auburn, loveliest village of the plain, is doubtless full of reminiscences of the poet's early years in Westmeath, but the sentiments, the rhythm, and the language are entirely cast in an English mould. We may mention in passing that it has been suggested that Swift derived the idea of the kingdom of Lilliput from the Irish story of the adventures of Fergus MacLeod among the leprechauns. All that can be said is that this derivation is not impossible, though the fact that the tale is preserved only in a single manuscript rather points to the conclusion that the story did not enjoy great popularity in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries. We have seen that Goldsmith was removed from an Irish atmosphere at a tender age, and this is not the only instance of the frowning of fortune upon the native literature. When the fame of the ancient bards of the Gael was noised from end to end of Europe, it was through the medium of Macpherson's forgeries. Fingal caught the fleeting fancy of the moment in a manner never achieved by the true oceanic lays of Ireland. The Relics of Irish Poetry, published by Miss Brooke, by subscription in Dublin in 1789, to vindicate the antiquity of the literature of Erin, never went into a second edition. And although some of the pieces contained in that volume have been reprinted in such undertakings of a learned character as the volumes of the Dublin Oceanic Society, J. F. Campbell's Lorna Hain and Cameron's Reliquae Celticae, they have aroused little interest among those ignorant of the Irish tongue. During the nineteenth century the number of poets who drew upon Ireland's past for their themes increased considerably. The most popular of all is unquestionably the author of the Irish melodies. But here again, the poet owes little or nothing to vernacular poetry. The mould is English. The sentiments are those of the poet's age. Moore's acquaintance with the native language can have been but of the slightest. And in the case of Mangan, we are told that he had to rely upon literal versions of Irish pieces furnished him by O'Donovan or O'Curry. Of the numerous attempts to reproduce the over-elaboration of rhyme to which Irish verse has ever been prone, Father Prout's Bells of Shandon is perhaps the only one that is at all widely known. When the legendary lore of Iceland became accessible to men of letters, owing to the labours of O'Curry, O'Donovan, and Hennessy, and the publication of various ancient texts by the Irish Archaeological Society, it was to be expected that an attempt would be made by some poet of Erin to do for his native land what the Wizard of the North had accomplished for Scotland. The task was undertaken by Sir Samuel Ferguson, who met with conspicuous success. His most ambitious effort, Conger, deals in epic fashion with the story of the Battle of Moira. Others, in similar strain, treat the story of Conair Mor and Deirdre, whilst others, such as the Tain Quest, are more in the nature of ballads. Ferguson did more to introduce the English reading public to Irish story than would have been accomplished by any number of bald translations. His diction is little affected by the originals, and he sometimes treats his materials with great freedom, but his achievement was a notable one, and he has not infrequently been acclaimed as the national poet. It is perhaps invidious to single out any living author for special mention, but this brief survey cannot close without noticing the dramatic poems of W. B. Yeats, the latest poet who attempts to present the old stories in an English dress. His plays, On Byla's Strand, Deirdre, and others, have become familiar to English audiences through the excellent acting of the members of the Abbey Theatre Company. The original texts are now much better known than they were in Ferguson's day, and Mr. Yeats, consequently, cannot permit himself the same liberties. Similarly, it is only during the last twenty-five years that the language of Irish poetry has been carefully studied, 
and Mr. Yeats has this advantage over his predecessors that on occasion, e.g., in certain passages in the King's Threshold, he is able to introduce with great effect reminiscences of the characteristic epithets and imagery which formed so large a part of the stock and trade of the medieval bard. References Friedel and Meyer, La Vision de Tondal, Paris, 1907. Boswell, An Irish Precursor of Dante, London, 1908. Cambridge History of English Literature, Volume 1, Chapters 12 and 16. Windisch, Das Keltische Britannien, Leipzig, 1912. More especially, Chapter 37. Dictionary of National Biography, Gwynne, Thomas More, English Men of Letters series, London, 1905. End of section 31. Section 32 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Section 32. Irish Folklore by Alfred Percival Graves Among savage peoples there is at first no distinction of a definite kind between good and bad spirits, and when a distinction has been reached, a great advance in a spiritual direction has been made. For the key to the religion of savages is fear, and until such terror has been counteracted by belief in beneficent powers, civilization will not follow but the elimination of the fear of the unseen is a slow process indeed it will exist side by side with the belief in christianity itself after a modification through various stages of better pagan belief ireland still presents in its more out-of-the-way districts evidence of that strong persistence in the belief in maleficent or malicious influences of the pre-christian powers of the air which it seems difficult to eradicate from the celtic imagination in the celebrated poem entitled the breastplate of saint patrick there is much the same attitude on the part of patrick towards the druids and their powers of concealing and changing of paralyzing and cursing as was shown by moses towards the magicians of egypt indeed in patrick's time a belief in the world of fairies existed even in the king's household for when the two daughters of king leary of ireland ethnia the fair and fidelma the ruddy came early one morning to the well of clebach to wash they found there a synod of holy bishops with patrick and they knew not whence they came or in what form or from what people or from what country but they supposed them to be dhuin sheikh or gods of the earth or a phantasm kolgan explains the term dhuin sheikh thus fantastical spirits he writes are by the irish called men of the she because they are seen as it were to come out of the beautiful hills to infest men and hence the vulgar belief that they reside in certain subterranean habitations, and sometimes the hills themselves are called by the Irish Sheed or Shida. No doubt, when the princesses spoke of the gods of the earth, reference was made to such pagan deities as Baal, Dagda the Great, or the Good God, Aina the Moon, goddess of the water and of wisdom, Mananan Maclear, the Irish Neptune, Chrome, the Irish Ceres, and even the Benevolent, whose relations to the Irish Oirfi resembled those of Apollo towards Orpheus, and to the allegiance they owed to the elements, the wind and the stars. But besides these pagan divinities and powers, and quite apart from them, the early Irish believed in two classes of fairies. In the first place, a hierarchy of fairy beings well and ill disposed 
not differing in appearance to any degree and at any rate from human beings good spirits and demons rarely visible during the daytime and in the second place there was the magic race of the didanan who after conquest by the benisians transformed themselves into fairies and in that guise continued to inhabit the underworld of the irish hills and to issue thence in support of irish heroes or to give their aid against other fairy adversaries there is another theory to account for the fairy race it is that they are angels who revolted with satan and were excluded from heaven for their unworthiness but were not found evil enough for hell and therefore were allowed to occupy that intermediate space which has been called the other world it is still a moot point with the irish peasantry as it was with the irish saints of old whether after being compelled to dwell without death among rocks and hills lakes and seas bushes and forest till the day of judgment the fairies then have the chance of salvation indeed the fairies are themselves believed to have great doubts of a future existence though like many men entertaining undefined hopes of happiness and hence the enmity which some of them have for mankind who they acknowledge will live eternally thus their actions are balanced between generosity and vindictiveness towards the human race mr w y evans wentz a m of leland stanford university california and jesus college oxford has received an honorary degree from the latter university for his thesis the fairy faith in celtic countries its psychical origin and nature a most laborious as well as ingenious work whose object is to prove that the origin of the fairy faith is psychical and that fairyland being thought of as an invisible world within which the visible world is immersed as an island in an unexplored ocean actually exists and that it is peopled by more species of living beings than this world because incomparably more vast and varied in its possibilities this may be added as a fourth theory to account for the existence of fairies and it may be further stated here that the irish popular belief in ghosts attributes to some of their departed spirits much of the same violence and malice with which fairies are credited mr jeremiah curtin gives striking instances of this kind in his book the folklore of west kerry it became necessary therefore for the gales who believed in the preternatural powers of the fairies for good and ill to propitiate them as far as possible on may eve accordingly cattle were driven into wraths and bled there some of the blood being tasted the rest poured out in sacrifice men and women were also bled on these occasions the seekers for buried treasure over which fairies were supposed to have influence immolated a black cock or a black cat to propitiate them again a cow suffering from sickness believed to be due to fairy malice was bled and then devoted to st martin if it recovered it was never sold or killed the first new milk of a cow was poured out on a ground to propitiate the fairies and especially on the ground within a fairy wrath the first drop of any drink is also thrown out by old irish people if a child spills milk the mother says that's for the fairies leave it to them and welcome slops should never be thrown out of doors without the warning take care of water lest fairies should be passing invisibly and get soiled by the discharge eddies of dust upon the road are supposed to be caused by the fairies and tufts of grass sticks and pebbles are thrown into the centre of the eddy to propitiate the unseen beings some fairies of life size who live within the green hills or under the raths are supposed to carry off healthy babes to be made fairy children their abstractors leaving weak changelings in their place similarly nursing mothers are sometimes supposed to be carried off to give the breast to fairy babes and handsome young men are spirited away to become bridegrooms to fairy brides 
again folk suffering from falling sickness are supposed to be in that condition owing to the fatigue caused by nocturnal rides through the air with the fairies whose steeds are bewitched rushes blades of grass straws fern roots and cabbage stalks the latter to be serviceable for the purpose should be cut into the rude shapes of horses before the metamorphosis can take place iron of every kind keeps away malignant fairies thus a horseshoe nailed to the bottom of the churn prevents butter from being bewitched here is a form of charm against the fairies who have bewitched the butter every window should be barred a great turf fire should be lit upon which nine irons should be placed the bystanders chanting twice over in irish come butter come peter stands at the gate waiting for a buttered cake as the irons become heated the witch will try to break in asking the people to take the irons which are burning her off the fire on their refusing she will go and bring back the butter to the churn the irons may then be removed from the fire and all will go well if a neighbour or stranger should enter a cottage during the churning he should put his hand to the dash or the butter will not come a small piece of iron should be sewed into an infant's clothes and kept there until the child is baptized and salt should be sprinkled over his cradle to preserve the babe from abduction the fairies are supposed to have been conquered by an iron weaponed race and hence their dread of the metal to recover a spellbound friend stand on all hallows eve at crossroads or at a spot pointed out by a wise woman or a fairy doctor when you have rubbed fairy ointment on your eyelids the fairies will become visible as the host sweeps by with its captive whom the gazer will then be able to recognize a sudden gust announces their approach stooping down you will then throw dust or milk at the procession whose members are then obliged to surrender your spellbound friend if a man leaves home after his wife's confinement some of his clothes should be spread over the mother and infant or the fairies may carry them off it is good for a woman but bad for a man to dream of fairies it betokens marriage for a girl misfortune for a man who should not undertake serious business for some time after such dreaming fairy changelings may be recognized by tricky habits constant crying and other unusual characteristics it was customary to recover the true child in the following way the changeling was placed upon an iron shovel over the fire when it would go shrieking up the chimney and the bona fide human child would be restored it was believed that fairy changelings often produced a set of small bagpipes from under the clothes and played dance music upon them till the inmates of the cottage dropped with exhaustion from the effects of the step-dancing they were compelled to engage in on Samhain eve the night before the first of november or as it is now called all hallows night or halloween all the fairy hills or shees are thrown wide open and the fairy host issues forth as mortals who are bold enough to venture near may see naturally therefore people keep indoors so as not to encounter the spectral host the superstition that the fairies are abroad on Samhain night still exists in ireland and scotland and there is a further belief no doubt derived from it that the graves are open on that night and that the spirits of the dead are abroad salt as already suggested is regarded to be so lucky that if a child falls he should always be given three pinches of salt and if a neighbour calls to borrow salt it should not be refused even though it be the last grain in the house an infant born with teeth should have them drawn by the nearest smith and the first teeth when shed should be thrown into the fire lest the fairies should get hold of what had been a part of you those who hear fairy music are supposed to be haunted by the melody and many are believed to go mad or commit suicide in consequence 
the fairies are thought to engage in warfare with one another and in the year eighteen hundred a specially sanguinary battle was believed to have been fought between two clans of the fairies in county kilkenny in the morning the hawthorns among the fences were found crushed to pieces and drenched with blood in popular belief fairies often go hunting and faint sounds of fairy horns the baying of fairy hounds and the crackling of fairy whips are supposed to be heard on these occasions while the flight of the hunters is said to resemble in sound the humming of bees besides the life-sized fairies who are reputed to have these direct dealings with human beings there are diminutive preternatural beings who are also supposed to come into close touch with men among these is the luchriman le Hrogan, or brog maker otherwise known as leprechaun he is always found mending or making a shoe and if grasped firmly and kept constantly in view will disclose hidden treasure to you or render up his sparo na schillinge or purse of the inexhaustible shilling he can only be bound by a plough chain or woollen thread he is the symbol of industry which if steadily faced leads to fortune but if lost sight of is followed by its forfeiture love in idleness is personified by another pygmy the jenkanach love talker he does not appear like the leprechaun with a purse in one of his pockets but with his hands in both of them and a dudeen short pipe in his mouth as he lazily strolls through lonely valleys making love to the foolish country lasses and gostering with the idle boys to meet him meant bad luck and whoever was ruined by ill-judged love was said to have been with the jeanconach another evil sprite was the clubber chan a jolly red-faced drunken little fellow always found astride of a wine-butt singing and drinking from a full tankard in a hard drinker's cellar and bound by his appearance to bring its owner to a speedy ruin then there were the lanon sheikhs or native muses to be found in every place of note to inspire the local bard and the banshees banshees fairy women attached to each of the old irish families and giving warning of the death of one of its members with piteous lamentations black joanna of the boyne shubanduch na boyne appeared on halloween in the shape of a great black fowl bringing luck to the home whose banity woman of the house kept the dwelling constantly clean and neat the puka who appeared in the shape of a horse and whom shakespeare is by many believed to have adapted as puck was a goblin who combined horseplay with viciousness but also at times helped with the housework the dulagan was a churchyard demon whose head was of a movable kind dr joyce writes you generally meet him with his head in his pocket under his arm or absent altogether or if you have the fortune to light upon a number of the dooligans you may see them amusing themselves by flinging their heads at one another or kicking them for footballs an even more terrible churchyard demon is the fascinating phantom that waylays the widower at his wife's very tomb and poisons him by her kiss when he has yielded to her blandishments of monsters the irish had and still believe in the piast latin bestia huge dragon or serpent confined to lakes by saint patrick till the day of judgment but still occasionally seen in their waters in old finian times namely the days of finn and his companion knights the piasts however roamed the country devouring men and cattle in large numbers and some of the early heroes are recorded to have been swallowed alive by them and then to have hewed their way out of their entrails merrows or mermaids 
are also still believed in and many folk tales still exist describing their intermarriage with mortals according to nicholas o'kearney it is the general opinion of many old persons versed in native traditional lore that before the introduction of christianity all animals possessed the faculties of human reason and speech and old story-tellers will gravely inform you that every beast could speak before the arrival of st patrick but that the saint having expelled the demons from the land by the sound of his bell all the animals that before that time had possessed the power of foretelling future events such as the black steed of Bianachlabra, the royal cat of Clomachrichcat, Cloch, and others became mute, and many of them fled to Egypt and other foreign countries. Cats are said to have been appointed to guard hidden treasures, and there are few who have not heard old Irish people tell about strange meetings of cats and violent battles fought by them in the neighborhood. It was believed, adds O'Kearney, that an evil spirit in the shape of a cat assumed command over these animals in various districts and that when these wicked beings pleased they could compel all the cats belonging to their divisions to attack those of some other district the same was said of rats and rat expellers when commanding a colony of those troublesome and destructive animals to emigrate to some other place used to address their billet to the infernal rat supposed to hold command over the rest in a curious pamphlet on the power of bardic compositions to charm and expel rats lately published mr eugene o'curry states that a degraded priest who was descended from an ancient family of hereditary bards was enabled to expel a colony of rats by the force of satire hence of course shakespeare's reference to rhyming irish rats to death it will thus be seen that irish fairy lore well deserves to have been called by mr alfred nutt one of the leaning authorities on the subject as fair and bounteous a harvest of myth and romance as ever flourished among any race references alex carmichael carmina gadelica david comin the boyish exploits of finn the periodical folklore lady gregory cuchulain of muirthemna gods and fighting men miss eleanor hull the cuchulain saga in irish literature douglas hyde beside the fire a collection of gaelic irish folk stories Levar shelecha folk stories in irish irish penny journal patrick kennedy the Fireside Stories of Ireland, Legendary Fictions of the Irish Celt, Standish Hayes O'Grady, Silva Gedelica, Wood Martin, Traces of the Elder Faiths in Ireland, Pagan Ireland, W. Y. Wentz, The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, Lady Wilde, Charms, Incantations, etc., Celtic Articles in Hastings Dictionary of Religion and Ethics. End of section 32. Section number 33 of The Glories of Ireland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P.J. Lennox section number thirty three irish wit and humor by charles l graves no record of the glories of ireland would be complete without an effort however inadequate to analyze and illustrate her wit and humor often misunderstood misrepresented and misinterpreted they are nevertheless universally admitted to be racial traits and for an excellent reason other nations exhibit these qualities in their literature and ireland herself is rich in writers who have furnished food for mirth but her special preeminence resides in the possession of what to adapt a famous phrase may be called in anima naturaliter jocosa irish wit and irish humour are a national inheritance they are inherent in the race as a whole 
independent of education or culture or comfort the best irish sayings are the sayings of the people the greatest irish humorists are the nameless multitude who have never written books or found a place in national dictionaries of biography none but an irishman could have coined that supreme expression of contempt i wouldn't be seen dead with him at a pig fair or rebuked a young barrister because he did not squander his carcass for example gesticulate enough but we cannot trace the paternity of these sayings any more than we can that of the lightning retort of the man to whom one of the quality had given a glass of whiskey that's made another man of you patsy remarked the donor deed it has sore patsy flashed back and that other man would be glad of another glass it is enough for our purpose to note that such sayings are typically irish and that their peculiar felicity consists in their combining both wit and humor to what element is the irish nature are we to attribute this joyous and illuminating gift no one who was not a gaelic scholar can venture to dogmatize on this thorny subject but setting philology and politics aside it is hard to avoid the conclusion that ireland has gained rather than lost in this respect by the clash of races and languages gaiety we are told is not the predominating characteristic of the celtic temperament nor is it reflected in the prose and verse of the old ancient days that have come down to us glamour and magic and passion abound in the lays and legends of the ancient gale but there is more melancholy than mirth in these tales of long ago indeed it is interesting to note in connection with this subject that the younger school of irish writers associated with what is called the celtic renaissance have with very few exceptions sedulously eschewed anything approaching to jocosity preferring the paths of crepuscular mysticism or sombre realism and openly avowing their distaste for what they consider to be the denationalized sentiment of moore lovar and lover to say this is not to disparage the genius of yeats and seeing it is merely a statement of fact and an illustration of the eternal dualism of the irish temperament which moore himself realized when he wrote of aaron the tear and the smile in thine eye a reaction against the donnybrook tradition was inevitable and to great extent wholesome since the stage irishman of the transpotine drama or the music halls was for most part a gross and unlovely caricature but like all reactions it has tended to be obscure the real merits and services of those who showed the other side of the medal lever did not exaggerate more than dickens and his portraits of galway fox-hunters and duelists of soldiers of fortune and of dublin undergraduates were largely based on fact at his best was a most exhilarating companion and his pictures of irish life if partial were not misleading he held no brief for the landlords and in his later novels showed a keen sense of their shortcomings the plain fact is that in considering the literary glories of ireland we cannot possibly overlook the work of those irishmen who were affected by english influences or wrote for an english audience anglo-irish humorous literature was a comparatively late product but its efflorescence was rapid and triumphant the first great name is that of goldsmith and though deeply influenced in technique and choice of subjects by his association with english men of letters and by his residence in england in spirit he remained irish to the end generous impulsive and improvident in his life genial gay and tender-hearted in his works the vicar of wakefield was dr primrose but he might just as well have been called dr shamrock no surer proof of the preeminence of irish wit and humour can be found than in the fact that shakespeare alone excepted no writers of comedy have held the boards longer or more triumphantly than goldsmith and his brother irishman sheridan she stoops to conquer the rivals the school for scandal and the critic represent the sunny side of the irish genius to perfection they illustrate in the most convincing way possible how the debt of the world to ireland has been increased by the fate which ordained that her choicest spirits should express themselves in a language of wider appeal than the ancient speech of erin on the other hand english literature and the english tongue have gained greatly from the influence exerted by writers familiar from their childhood with turns of speech and modes of expression which 
even when they are not translations from the gaelic are characteristic of the hibernian temper the late dr p w joyce in his admirable treatise on english as spoken in ireland has illustrated not only the essentially bilingual character of the anglo-irish dialect but the modes of thought which it enshrines there is no better known form of irish humour than that commonly called the irish bowl which is too often set down to lax thinking and faulty logic but it is the rarest thing to encounter a genuine irish bull which is not picturesque and at the same time highly suggestive take for example the saying of an old carry doctor who when conversing with a friend on the high rate of mortality observed bedad there's people dying who never died before here a truly illuminating result was attained by the simple device of using the indicative for the conditional mood as in juvenal's famous comment on cicero's second philippe antoni gladios foti contemner sisic omnia dixent the irish bull is a heroic and sometimes successful attempt to sit upon two stools at once or as an irishman put it englishmen often make bulls but the irish bull is always pregnant though no names of such outstanding distinction as those of goldsmith and sheridan occur in the early decades of the nineteenth century the spirit of irish comedy was kept vigorously alive by maria edgeworth william magnan francis mahoney father product and william carleton sir walter scott's splendid tribute to the genius of maria edgeworth is regarded by some critics as extravagant but it is largely confirmed in a most unexpected quarter turgenia the great russian novelist proclaimed himself her disciple and has left it on record that but for her example he might never have attempted to give literary form to his impressions of the classes in russia corresponding to the poor irish and the squireens and the squires of county langford magin and mahoney were both scholars the latter happily called himself an irish potato seasoned with attic salt wrote largely for english periodicals and spent most of their lives out of ireland in the writings of all three of an element of the grotesque is observable tempered however in the case of mahoney with the vein of tender pathos which emerges in his delightful bells of shandon mcgean was a wit mahoney was the hedge schoolmaster in excelsis and carleton was the first realist in irish peasant fiction but all alike drew their best inspiration from essentially irish themes the pendulum has swung back slowly but steadily since the days when irish men of letters found it necessary to accommodate their genius to purely english literary standards even lever though he wrote for the english public wrote mainly about ireland so too with his contemporary la Fanu, whose reputation rests on a double basis he made some wonderful excursions into the realm of the bizarre the uncanny and the gruesome but in the collection known as the purcell papers we found three short stories which for exuberant drollery and diversion have never been excelled that the same man could have written uncle silas and the quarjander is yet another proof of the strange dualism of irish character the record of the last fifty years shows an uninterrupted progress in the invasion of the english bell's letters by irish writers outside literature perhaps the most famous sayer of good things of our times was a simple irish parish priest the late father Heavy. of his humorous sayings the number is legion his wit may be illustrated by a less familiar example his comment on a very tall young lady named lynch nature gave her an inch and she took an l in the house of commons to-day there is no greater master of irony and sardonic humour than his namesake mr tim healy on one occasion he remarked that lord rosebery was not a man to go tire shooting with except at the zoo on another being anxious to bring an indictment against the castle regime in dublin and finding the way blocked by a debate on uganda he successfully accomplished his purpose by a judicious geographical transference of names and convulsed the house by a speech in which the nomenclature of central africa was applied to the government of ireland but wit and humour are the monopoly of no class or calling in ireland they flourish alike among car drivers and casey's publicans 
and policemen priests and parsons beggars and peers it is commonplace of criticism to deny these qualities in their highest form to women but this is emphatically untrue of ireland and was never more conclusively disproved than by the recent literary achievements of her daughters the partnership of two irish ladies miss edith somerville and miss violet martin has given us in some experiences of an irish r m for example resident magistrate the most delicious comedy and in the real charlotte the finest tragic comedy that have come out of great britain in the last thirty years the r m as it is familiarly called is already a classic but the irish comedy humane to use the phrase in the sense of balzac is even more vividly portrayed in the pages of the real charlotte humor genuine though intermittent irradiates the autumnal talent of miss jane barlow and the long roll of gifted irish women who have contributed to the gaiety of nations may be closed with the names of miss hunt author of folk tales of breffney of miss perdone and miss winifred letts who in prose and verse respectively have moved us to tears and laughter by their studies of lanaster peasant life and of maura o'nell mrs Scrine, the imperable singer of the glens of antrium and to give a full list of the living irish writers male and female who are engaged in the benevolent work of driving dull care away would be impossible within the space at our command but we cannot end without recognition of our exhilarating extravaganzas of george a birmingham canon Hannay, the freakish and elfin muse of james stevens and the coruscating wit of f p dunn the famous irish american humorist whose mr dooley is a household word on both sides of the atlantic references goldsmith vicar of wakefield she stoops to conquer sheridan the rivals the school for scandal the critic r edgeworth essay on irish bulls m edgeworth castle rackrent the absentee mcginn miscellanies in prose and verse carleton traits and stories of the irish peasantry mahoney father prout relics of father prout john and michael bannum tales of the o'hara family lover legends and stories of ireland andy andy lever harry michael bannum tales of the o'hara family lover legends and stories of ireland andy andy lever harry laura career charles o'malley lord kilgobbin le fanu le purcell papers barlow bogland studies irish ideals irish neighbors birmingham the seething pot spanish gold the major's niece the red hand of ulster general john reagan stevens the crock of gold here are ladies hunt the folk tales of breffney perdone the folk of furry farm somerville and ross the real charlotte some experiences of an irish r m all on the irish shore dan russell the fox end of section number thirty three recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america section thirty four of the glories of ireland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. The Glories of Ireland, edited by Joseph Dunn and P. J. Lennox. Section 34. The Irish Theatre by Joseph Holloway. The Irish theatre and secular drama may be said to begin with the production of James Shirley's historical play St. Patrick for Ireland in Werborough Street Theatre about 1636 to 7. And although Dublin was a great school for acting and supplied many of the best players to the English stage, such as Quinn, Macklin, Peg Woofington, Miss O'Neill, and hosts of others, it never really possessed a creative theatre, save at the Keppel Street Theatre for a few years during the Grattan Parliament, until the modern movement in Ireland came into being 
and the Abbey Theatre became its headquarters. Of course, innumerable plays by Irish writers were written, but most of them were not distinctively Irish in character, and the names of Goldsmith, Sheridan, O'Keefe, Farquhar, Sheridan Knowles, Oscar Wilde, and dozens of others will always be remembered as great Irish writers for the stage. And when fine impersonators of Irish character, like Tyrone Power, John Drew, or Barney Williams arrived, there were always to be found several clever writers to fit them with parts, the demand always creating the supply. Even before Dion Boucicault took to writing Irish dramas of a more palatable and less stage Irish character than those of his immediate predecessors, some excellent plays, Irish in character and tone, had from time to time found their way to the stage. However, Boucicault sweetened our stage by the production of the Colleen Baum, Arana Pogue, the Chagrin, and showed by his rollicking impersonations of Miles, Sean, and Con, how good-humoured, hearty, and self-sacrificing Irish boys in humble life can be. He had great technical knowledge of stagecraft, and that has helped to make his Irish plays live and the popular goodwill right up to today. A revolt against Boussicault's Irish boys all fun and frolic, and charming Colleen's, who could do no wrong, has made our modern playwrights go to the other extreme, so that now we find our stage peopled with peasants, cruel, hard, and forbidding for the most part, and with Colleen's, who are the reverse of lovable in thought or act. Neither picture is quite true of our people. What is really wanted is the happy medium, which few, if any, of our new playwrights have yet given us. If our great popular Irish drama has yet to come, I think the Fays have made it possible to say that a distinct and really fine dramatic school has arisen in Ireland and evolved out of their wonderful skill in teaching, producing, and acting. And if we are not always really delighted with what our playwrights give us, the almost perfect way in which the plays are served up by the actors invariably wholly satisfies. It is the actors who have made the Abbey Theatre famous, and not the plays. Such acting as theirs cast a spell over all who see them. What pleasing memories do the names of W. G. Fay, Frank J. Fay, Dudley Diggs, Sarah Allgood, Arthur Sinclair, Mayor O'Neill, Mayor Nishui Lebach, J. M. Kerrigan, Fred O'Donovan, Eileen O'Doherty, Una O'Connor, Anthony Magee, Nora Desmond, and John Connolly recall. With the production of W. B. Yeats' poetic one-act play, The Land of Heart's Desire, at the Avenue Theatre, London, on March 29, 1894, began the modern Irish dramatic movement. When the poet had tasted the joys of the footlights, he longed to see an Irish literary theatre realised in Ireland. Five years later, in the ancient concert rooms, Dublin, on May 9, 1899, his play, the Countess Kathleen was produced, and his desire gratified. The experiment was tried for three years and then dropped. Plays by Yeats, Edward Martin, George Moore, and Alice Milligan were staged with English-trained actors in the casts. And a Gaelic play, the first ever presented in a theatre in Ireland, was also given during the third season. It was The Twisting of the Rope by Dr. Douglas Hyde and was played at the Gaiety Theatre Dublin on October 21st, 1901 by a Gaelic Amateur Dramatic Society coached by W. G. Fay. The author filled the principal part with distinction. It was while rehearsing this play that the thought came to Fay. 
why not have my little company of irish-born actors the ormond dramatic society appear in plays by irish writers instead of in the ones they have been giving for years and the thought soon ripened into realization his brother frank had dreamed of such a company since he read of the small beginnings out of which the norwegian theatre had grown and just then seeing some of a's george russell's play deirdre in the all ireland review he asked the author if he would allow them to produce it and consent being given the company put it into rehearsal at once a got for them from yeats kathleen nihulehan to make up the programme thus it was that this company of amateurs and poets now known as the abbey players came into existence and at st Teresa's hall clarendon street dublin gave their first performance on april second nineteen o two shortly afterwards they took a hall at the back of a shop in camden street where they rehearsed and gave a few public performances on a declining to be their president frank fay suggested the name of w b yeats and he was elected and in that way came again into the movement in which he has figured so largely ever since the company played occasionally in the molesworth hall and produced there among other pieces sings in the shadow of the glen october eighth nineteen o three and riders to the sea february twenty fifth nineteen o four yeats's the hourglass march fourteenth nineteen o three and the king's threshold october eighth nineteen o three lady gregory's twenty five march fourteenth nineteen o three and padre colum's broken soil december third nineteen o three on march twenty sixth nineteen o four the company paid a flying one-day visit to the royalty london and miss a e f horniman who had given shaw yeats and dr john todhunter their first real start as playwrights at the avenue london in march april eighteen ninety four shaw had had his first play widowers houses played by the independent theatre in eighteen ninety two saw the performance and was so impressed that she thought she would like to find a suitable home for such talent in dublin and fixed upon the old mechanics institute and its surrounding buildings and there the abbey theatre soon afterwards on december twenty seventh nineteen o four came into existence in writing of this irish dramatic movement one must always bear in mind that it was yeats who first conceived the idea of such a movement the fays who founded the school of irish acting and miss horniman who like a fairy godmother waved the wand and gave it a habitation and a name the abbey theatre and endowed it for six years play followed play with great rapidity and dramatic societies sprang up all over the country playing home-made productions in gaelic and english all ireland seemed to be play-acting and play-writing so much so that frank fay was heard to say that he thought every one had a play in his pocket and that any one in the street could be picked up and shaped into an actor or actress with a little training ireland was so teeming with talent dramatic ireland had slumbered for a long while and awoke with tremendous vigour for work new dramatists sprang up in all parts of ireland the ulster literary theatre started in belfast the cork dramatic society in cork the theatre of ireland in dublin and others in galway and waterford soon followed in dublin at present more than half a dozen dramatic societies are continually producing new plays and discovering new acting talent there are also two gaelic dramatic societies and nearly every town in ireland now has its own dramatic class and its own dramatists 
all this activity has come about within the last ten or twelve years where before in many places drama and acting were almost unknown many gaelic societies throughout the country put on gaelic plays by dr douglas hyde pierce beasley thomas haynes canon peter o'leary and others and the oerechtas the gaelic musical and literary festival held each year in dublin usually presents several irish plays and offers prizes for new ones at each festival of all the irish playwrights who have arisen in recent years lady gregory has produced most and w b yeats is the most poetic he is more a lyric poet than a dramatist and is never satisfied with his work for the stage but keeps eternally chopping and changing it his kathleen Nihulahan, though a dream play always appeals to an audience of irish people perhaps his one act deirdre is the nearest approach to real drama he has done some of lady gregory's earlier one-act farces such as the workhouse ward are very amusing the rising of the moon is a little dramatic gem and the gale gate is touched with genuine tragedy singh wrote only one play riders to the sea that acts well the others are admired by critics for the strangeness of their diction and the beauty of the nature pictures scattered through them his much discussed playboy of the western world has become famous for the rows it has created at home and abroad from its very first production on january twenty sixth nineteen o seven william boyle who gets to the heart of those he writes about has produced the most popular play of the movement in the eloquent dempsey and a perfectly constructed one in the building fund w f casey's two plays the man who missed the tide and the suburban groove are both popular and actable padre colum's plays the land and broken soil the latter rewritten and renamed the fiddler's house are almost idyllic scenes of country life lennox robinson's plays are harsh in tone but dramatically effective and t c murray's birthright and maurice hart are fine dramas well constructed and full of true knowledge of the people he writes about Shomas O'Kelly has written two strong dramas in The Schuler's Child and The Bribe, and Shomas O'Brien, one of the funniest Irish farces ever staged in duty. R. J. Ray's play, The Casting Out of Martin Whelan, is the best this dramatist has as yet given us, and George Fitzmaurice's The Country Dressmaker has the elements of good drama in it st john g irvine has written a very human drama in mixed marriage he hails from the north of ireland but rutherford maine is the best of the northern playwrights and his plays the drone and the turn of the road are splendid homely county down comedies bernard shaw's john bull's other island as irish plays go is a fine specimen canon hannay has written two successful comedies eleanor's enterprise and general john reagan the latter not wholly to the taste of the people of the west james stevens and jane barlow have also tried their hands at playwriting with but moderate success perhaps the modern drama that made the most impression when first played was the heatherfield by edward martin it gripped and remains a lasting memory with all who saw it in eighteen ninety nine but i think i have written enough to show that the irish theatre of to-day is in a very alive condition and that if the great national dramatist has not yet arrived 
he is sure to emerge when that time comes the actors are here ready to interpret such work to perfection an article however brief on the irish theatre would be incomplete without mention of the world-famous tragedians john edward mccullough lawrence patrick barrett and barry sullivan of genial comedians like charles sullivan and hubert o'grady of sterling actors like sheil barry john brougham leonard boyne j d beveridge and thomas nerney or of operatic artists like dennis o'sullivan and joseph o'mara many of whom have passed away but some fortunately are with us still references john genist some account of the english stage from the restoration to eighteen thirty eighteen thirty two volume ten is devoted to the irish stage chetwood general history of the stage more particularly of the irish theatre dublin seventeen forty nine malloy romance of the irish stage baker biographia dramatica dublin seventeen eighty two hitchcock an historical view of the irish stage from its earliest period down to the season of seventeen eighty eight doran their majesty's servants or annals of the english stage london eighteen sixty five hughes the pre-victorian drama in dublin the history of the theatre royal dublin dublin 1870 levy and o'rourke annals of the theatre royal dublin 1880 o'neill irish theatrical history dublin 1910 brown a guide to books on ireland dublin 1912 lawrence the abbey theatre in the weekly freeman dublin december 1912 origin of the abbey theatre in sinn fein dublin february 14 1914 vagant irish plays and playwrights london 1913 lady gregory our irish theatre london nineteen fourteen bourgeois john m singh and the irish theatre london nineteen thirteen moore hail and farewell three volumes london nineteen eleven nineteen fourteen asmore the ulster literary theatre in the lady of the house dublin november fifteenth nineteen thirteen the reviews beltane eighteen ninety nine to nineteen hundred and sawan nineteen o one to nineteen o three end of section number thirty four